record and then I'll start the broadcast now. <clears throat> Always my greatest fear that the technology won't work on the day. Exactly. <laughs> Doing okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh... the magic. Good morning, everyone. Bom dia. Thank you for joining us today. We'll wait a few more minutes until we start officially. Andrew, you noticed I practiced my Portuguese for this morning's presentation. Did you? Yeah. Bom dia. That's where it ends. That's it. Obrigado, and then I'm done. <laughs> A good start, David. Uh, Extended my Portuguese right there. And how is your French? Uh, je parle français un petit peu. Un petit peu. I have promised to to Paris organizing committee to deliver at least half of the opening ceremony speech if I'm still present by then, of course, in French. Uh, but in a decent French, so I'm studying. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. I, I, did, I did not promise that for Japan. <laughs> for... <laughs> I'm having I'm having friends online sending me mocking mocking texts. About how I look. That's not. Yeah, it's not very nice. I mean, I'm already a little anxious about this. You look very well. What was it you talking about? <laughs> I put on a collared shirt for the first time since March of last year. So that's, yeah, this is a big deal. Well, from Ellie's window, uh, uh, I noticed that it's snowing. Yeah. So yeah, Eli's based in Boston, and there's quite a bit of snow here. I'm in uh, just outside of Calgary in Western Canada, and Dr. Stedward's in Edmonton, and there's a fair bit of snow here. It's quite chilly here right now. Not not quite like Brasilia, I'm anticipating. But no, today is a beautiful sunny day. We cannot go out, <laughs> or we should not. We are not supposed to get out to go out, right? But at least you know it's a beautiful day here, and. But yesterday we had some thunderstorms, which they which are summer, so it happened. All right, I am going to wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Oh, yeah. well, we have someone saying good afternoon from Paris. international yeah so claire is uh from paris she's a past president of ifapa yeah. she's the founder and owner of an organization called Movin. a friend of mine yeah. <clears throat> All right, well, let's get started. 
Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you so very much uh, for joining us uh, today. This is a, it's a great opportunity for us to have the President of the International Paralympic Committee, Mr. Andrew Parsons, join us. And it's a, it's, it's a true, true pleasure and honor to have you spend this hour with us, Mr. Parsons, Andrew. So, so thank you. Thank you for joining us. I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about what this is, what the Sedward Talks are, and then I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Sedward for some opening remarks. So the Sedward Talks uh, were created by myself as president of the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity and my good friend Eli Wolf uh, from Disability and Sport, as well as colleagues uh, Mary Holmes and Ted Fay, uh, also from the U.S. and other, other professors in sport and adapted physical activity. And we thought it was important for us to try to record um, and dig deeper into parts of the Paralympic movement from a historical perspective, and in particular as it relates to inclusion. Uh, and so we started our, our founding Stedward talk was with Dr. Stedward talking about uh, the, the, the creation of the International Paralympic Committee. And since then we've had seven others where we've looked at, for instance, specific sports like para ice hockey, sitting volleyball. And then we've also looked at issues such as inclusion within the Commonwealth Games or the factor system used in Nordic skiing and how that then impacted inclusion. So we've been doing these again for the last couple of years and, and this is now I believe our eighth, our eighth session. So we're very excited uh, to get going on this. And so with that, and I, I should mention that Eli is also a, a Paralympic athlete himself, he competed in 1996 in Atlanta and 2004 in uh, Athens in soccer. And now it gives me great pleasure, Dr. Sedward, to pass uh, the microphone over to you. Dr. Sedward, the founding president, of course, of the International Paralympic Committee, was recently awarded the Companion of the Order of Canada. For those of you outside of Canada, that's the highest uh, recognition uh, for a Canadian to be, to be recognized for their contributions to our society. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, uh, he was my supervisor for my PhD. Uh, at the University of Alberta. His crowning achievement, as I know he likes to say, is being uh, my faculty supervisor. Dr. Sedward, over to you for some opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, David, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be to everyone. Uh, I mean, first, I'm, I'm just so uh, pleased and, and honored to have uh, uh, you with us uh, here today, Andrew, as president of the International Paralympic Committee. Uh, but in order just to set the, the tone a little bit or the, the basis, I just thought I would go back uh, nearly uh, coming up to 32 years, just to talk a little bit about where we were at and, and uh, where we're at now, because you know, sort of after the 19, or during the mid 1980s, I was quite concerned at the direction sport was going for athletes living with a disability. So we were able to gather a, a number of countries from around the world um, and meet in Arnhem in the Netherlands in 1987. And it was during that period when we were quite concerned that the direction that our sport was going. First of all, we didn't have a democratic organization. There was no uh, involvement of the countries in what we should be doing, where we should be going, and how we should get there. So uh, we got together and gathered in Arnhem in 1987 and said, one, we need to have a new worldwide organization. Uh, two, it needs to be a democratically organized uh, uh, sport uh, aspects. Uh, three, we wanted to develop relationships with other international federations and in particularly the IOC. Uh, we needed to be a, a sport governing body, not a medical organization because it was very medically based back in our earlier in our earlier days. And then we also wanted to look at uh, our, the sports itself, uh, integration, inclusion, reducing the number of classes to ensure that we have the very best athletes. So when we were initially created in 1989, 
uh, I must admit, I never ever thought there would be so many challenges to overcome in building the foundation of our house. Um, but we did, uh, and I think we succeeded to a certain degree. Uh, as I said, there were not many nations who came to those initial meetings, 40 to 50 nations. Uh, and then along the way, the first few years of myself uh, as president, I mean, we, cha we had challenges dealing with uh, logo design, dealing uh, with uh, advertising sponsorship and partnerships, dealing with television, and, and in particular, dealing with developing a relationship with the International Olympic Committee. So I spent those first 12 years of my life in the early stages of the uh, uh, International Paralympic Committee, developing a, a personal relationship with then president of IOC, President Juan Antonio Samaranch, uh, and to see if we could come up with uh, a memorandum of understanding whereby our two organizations could work together to present uh, a, a real uh, collective uh, competition for all of our Olympic and Paralympic athletes of the world. Uh, we did achieve that by signing the very first uh, Memorandum of Understanding in 2000 in Sydney, Australia. Uh, and I know that uh, President uh, uh, Andrew will certainly make comments uh, about uh, the, uh, the recent signing that, that he's been able to lead as well. So uh, we've now had you know, 31 years of, of growth over the years. And it certainly doesn't look today like it did back 31 years ago, because uh, we have professional coaches. We've got profession, professional people working in our headquarters, uh, led by very uh, capable people and, and certainly a capable board. And so I'm so uh, excited to see the, what the future has for us uh, in this organization. So uh, David, I think what I'll do is, uh, I think at, at this page, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm so excited to have you with us here today, Andrew, because uh, I remember three years ago being part of uh, the little commission that was responsible for managing the voting uh, process for the election of the president, vice president, and other members of the board. And I really was proud to say, and a little bit nervous, and I, when I sat behind the microphone, I was actually looking over towards uh, uh, Andrew and his wife, uh, and you could just see, the the motion on on his uh, on his face, and then to see it explode, you know, when I said, and the new president of the International Paralympic Committee uh, will be, and I'm proud to say, from Brazil, Andrew Parsons. So with that, David Andrew, I'm going to turn over everything else to you. Thank you. Dr. Stedward. And again, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, the third IPC president, Mr. Andrew Parsons, joining us this morning from Brasilia. Um, Andrew, I, we will get to that conversation about the interrelate or the relationships between the IOC and the IPC and how that relates to inclusion, both currently and perhaps in the future. But before we do that, I want you to tell us your story. Um, you and I first met, if I recall, in Mar del Plata. Um, with Jose Luis Campo, uh, as it relates to the 2003 Para Pan American Games, um, which were the second iteration of those games, and then you became certainly more involved in the hosting of the of the games, the Para Pan American Games in Rio de Janeiro in 2007. But I want you to tell us your story about how you became involved in the para sport system. Perhaps reflect on some mentors, you know, maybe even including a, a someone like a Jose Luis Campo, who I know you and I both hold in the highest regard. Um, and then perhaps even some seminal moments that led to your ultimately becoming uh, the third president of the IPC. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, David. And uh, Dr. Sedwa, Bob, as we are friends, uh, 
you made me emotional now. Uh, I was going to say that I will never forget your words. From Brazil, Mr. Andrew Parsons, and, and of course I exploded. While I was trying to behave, uh, I was trying to be nice with Miss, uh, with the other candidates, but it's so, I had had explosion and immediately I was trying to, you know, act with some dignity after the explosion, but it was difficult to control. Uh, but it's an honor to be with both of you, uh, you know, my predecessor, the founding president of the ITC, it's an honor. Uh, he's a, you know, as you know, well, you are a role model. You face all these challenges that you have faced with the ITC. Because uh, when when you mention things like oh, and we had this meeting with 40, 50 countries, today is easy. At that time, there, there was no internet, there was no mobile phones. You know, it's uh, some, most probably uh, some of the letters of invitation were were typed in 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 writing machines and not in computers. You know, so it's. Um, it's amazing to see what you have led, the way you have led this organization in the in the in its early years. And if you compare the organization when you became president, that was non-existent, to when you left the, the presidency in 2001, wow, you know. Uh, and I remember when I was at NTT Brazil, and I will speak a little bit about my trajectory in 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 a minute, uh, and dealing with those. Uh, agreement, the 2001, the 2000, and the 2001 agreement uh, from an NPC perspective and trying to understand uh, what it meant. Uh, so it's a, first of all, it's an honor and congratulations for, for this uh, being recognized with the companion of the Order of Canada. It's fantastic. You know, you have it's only you and other 164 individuals in Canada who have this honor at the moment. So congratulations, fantastic to see, and it's an honor. David, your friend, yeah, you're right. I think the first time we, we came across was uh, Mario Plata 2003, or something like that, in the preparation. Because you and I, we were involved with the America's Paralympic Committee. You were the second co officer, and I was the kind of secretary general, and Jose Luis was the president. And, and it was, in, that the journey towards those games were, was just incredible. If you remember all the things that we had to face, the lack of, uh, of support uh, uh, to the event by the local authorities and Jose Luis and his team of volunteers uh, doing basically everything by themselves. It was incredible. But so it's a pleasure to be with you in this several talks. And uh, I, I will follow some of the, uh, the from the ninth, the ninth edition on, I will follow more closely because you just mentioned some incredible, uh, interesting topics that you have uh, uh, discussed in these talks and it's like classification and inclusion and this is a topic that is of my interest and it has to do with how I started in, in the Paralympic movement and it started as an intern in the Brazilian Paralympic Committee communication department. I was at the university by then studying communication. I was always passionate about sport. Uh, as a good Brazilian I was passionate about what we call football, you guys call soccer. Uh, uh, but also I, I was in love also with the, with the Olympic movement and, and the values of the Olympic movement because I, I remember I had this collection of books that my father gave me when I was a kid and there were some chapters about the Olympic movement. So, you know, things from ancient Greece like Sidipides uh, to Spirit of Lois in the first uh, edition of the game in Athens to all the, you know, uh, Jackie Owens, all the, all the big names and of course the Brazilian uh, national heroes and, and values. And and as a, as a, as a kid, I, I I think I understood really early that it was more than just gold, silver, and bronze. And when I came across Paralympic movement was uh, was around Atlanta Games, 1986. So Robert was already the president, already facing challenges and, and leading the organization of the movement uh, because the games were on, on Brazilian TV. Uh, not, not live, uh, not, not broadcasting, it was more on the news. And Brazil was winning a few medals, so you know it, we got to know a few athletes. So what happened is that I was living in a city uh, in the Rio de Janeiro metropolitan area, and they happened to open the headquarters there of Brazilian Paralympic Committee, which was a very small house <laughs> painted in green and yellow. Uh, and basically, I went there to offer myself. I was a student. I said, "Look, I want to be. I want to work for you guys. I want to be an intern." 
and and uh, and the structure was so small at the time that I was interviewed by the president of the organization. So you know, an intern being interviewed by the president, and it took five minutes. And he said, "Look, uh, I cannot promise you much. We don't have resources. I can, but I can promise you a lot of work and to be involved in something that is fantastic." And I said, "Okay, fine, fantastic." And five, six weeks later, I I said, "Wow." This is what I like to do for the rest of my life. And that was 1997, one year after Atlanta. Uh, but it was very difficult by then. Uh, the Paralympic sport in Brazil was not even recognized by the Brazilian sport law. Uh, that, that, that happened in 1998. Uh, in terms of resources, it was really tough. And Brazil at the time had an extraordinary uh, ministry of sport. So it was not, let's say, a full ministry of sport. It was something really with a very low budget, people didn't know what Paralympic sport was in Brazil. But I think we managed to to keep on going, uh, and and I was absolutely passionate about what I was doing, as I'm still I still am today. You know, I'm a president with the with the heart of an intern uh, still. Uh, and then in 2001, I think it was one of the turning points in, in my in my my career, if I may say. Uh, there was a new president in the Brazilian Paralympic Committee, and he. He appointed me as Secretary General of the organization because there was a possibility of a law being approved in Brazil that we will um, generate a permanent funding to the Brazilian National Olympic Committee and to the National Olympic Committee as well. So he said, I want to structure the, the, the this organization better and so and so and I need you. And I said, basically I said, but why you need me? He said, I like the way you deal with persons with disabilities, and of course all your skills and so, but I like the way you, and he was a, a blind, a blind guy himself. And, and I said, but, but I deal with them as I do, I deal with everybody else. And he said, exactly, that's it. And I said, okay, I understand now. <laughs> so, so then we started this, uh, uh, and so I, I can't say that he was my first uh, kind of mentor, maybe not a mentor, but it was the first, person in the Paralympic movement who gave me an opportunity. Uh, I was 24 years old by then. And so point at 24 years old, I was already, I was still in the university, I was a, just had graduated uh, uh, as a second gen of an organization. He take a big risk. And he took it and, and I told him, so if you're taking a big risk, you know that. He said, yes, I know. And then one of the first things that he asked me to do, and it has to do with my, my my path in the Paralympic movement was exactly because we wanted the Brazilian Paralympic Committee to be a, a player at the international level. Not only when it comes, not only in the field of play, not only by providing the best structure and services to the athletes, but being, you know, influential or being part of the decisions, interacting, because at that time we were interacting with the ATC almost on a four year basis. You know, every four years we, we were going to the Olympics, to the Paralympics, and, you know, participating with the Brazilian team and coming back. There was not much interaction, and this was on our side, on our side. So we, I started interacting with the with the ATC, with the APC, and then uh, in, by the end of 2002, there was the World Premier World Championship in Mar del Plata, and there was a meeting of the APC, the, the Americas Paralympic Committee, and Jose Luis Campo came with that crazy idea, I must say, of in one year organizing the Para Pan American Games in Mando Plata in 2003. Uh, we, December 2002 to December 2003. Um, and we were all around that table crazy enough to say, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And at the time, the program was only swimming athletics and boxing. And if you remember, we delivered a Para Pan American Games with nine sports. Some sports, uh, some of the sports were added I don't know, two months prior to the opening of the games, like uh, equestrian and cycling. Uh, in equestrian, there were athletes in the Parapan American games coming from Europe. But I think this is one of the things that I have learned with Jose Luis Campo. And he, you're absolutely right, he was a mentor. He, he will always be a mentor for me. He was a little bit uh, disorganized or not very strict. I remember that we worked with him. But his passion and the way he could. He was able to infuse, let me say, or, or, or that, that passion in, in, in others was just amazing. Remember, it was him, a group of volunteers. A few months ago, we had a, I had one of, of these calls with that group of volunteers. And they are now all grown up now with families. And so it was fantastic. 
so that was the start of my, let's say, my, my international participation. You know, I was not elected. I said, we, as Brazil, we offered myself to Jose Luis, look, Andrew can help you. You know, the Brazilian NPC now has more structure and we can help you. And then, uh, then we, we delivered those games as, as successful as we could deliver. Uh, and it was great because many athletes from the region, they, they could qualify for the Athens game because of, of those games. And, and that was the idea of the Luis. Look, we have to offer more opportunities for the athletes of this region to qualify for, for, the, for the Paralympics without having to go to Europe or to Asia because, you know, most of the countries here, Latin America and Caribbean, so, you know, they don't have those resources. And then, of course, I got, I was heavily involved in the Parapanans in Rio 2007. And that was the moment, even in Brazil, where people started to look at me as a potential leader. Because I was second general of the NPC Brazil, was secretary general uh, of, of, of the America's Paralympic Committee. Then in 2005, I was elected president of the America's Paralympic Committee. And of course, this has a lot to do with, let's say, the structure that the NPC Brazil had at the time, uh, uh, and the fact that we have worked together with Jose Luis. And so, but also with the fact that we were going to host in three years time the Parapanans in Rio de Janeiro. And it was the first time ever that a regional game, a regional para game was organized by the same organizing committee and back to back with the, let's say, able body version of the regional game, the Panam game. Uh, and it was a huge success, you know, and it was a huge success in, uh, in Brazil. I think the numbers that we had and the fact that this is still the model, you know, after Rio, we had Guadalajara, so on, so. Lima, uh, we will have Santiago in 2023. So, but that, the, the way I led that process, and it was not easy, being in Brazil was not easy, a lot of influence from political leaders, and so, and you really gained from political uh, interest. So, it was at the opening ceremony of those games when people saw me speaking there, and I was 27 by then. Uh, people think this guy could be, could be a leader. I think he can be a leader here in Brazil. Uh, and two years later, I was elected president of the Brazilian Paralympic Committee, which uh, made some people might say, well, but you were president of the Americas, then you became president of the, of the Brazilian Paralympic Committee. It seems like it should be the other way around, but as you know, the Americas Paralympic Committee had zero budget at that time. <laughs> it was a very small organization, while the Brazilian Paralympic Committee was already a, a, a well-structured organization uh, with that law that I had mentioned, giving funding on a permanent basis, a good amount of, of resources, you know, uh, compared to what was uh, previously the budget of the NPC Brazil. So then, you know, being eight years as president of the Brazilian Paralympic Committee with the games in Rio, I think it gave me the possibility of, uh, of people in Brazil and in other nations to, to see, uh, let's say, the way I was, conducting or leading the organization. And, uh, and I think this helped to, 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 to gain some respect out there in the world. And then I started slowly to also have some positions in the IPC. So in 2006 or seven, I became, as I was president of the America's Olympic Committee, I joined the, what was the Regions Council. And then I, I joined the, the Paralympic Games Committee. And in 2009, I was elected as as a member at large, then in 2013 vice president, and then in 2017 president. So it was, I admit it was very fast, you know, from intern to president of the IPC in only 20 years. Uh, but I think I, 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 I was lucky enough to go to spend some very good time and quality time in all of these different positions and I remember going with athletes and, and when I was an intern, I was not only working with comms, I was basically doing everything. Since from translating to English and international, from English to Portuguese and international events, to pushing wheelchairs and you know, escorting athletes when they were going to doping, uh, you know, and just to translate. So I think I had the possibility of understanding a little bit of many processes. I remember in the old times, uh, uh, Robert, you probably remember the 1998 uh, Paraphatic Championship in Birmingham. Uh, and I was there again as, as a kind of a translator. And all of the 50 Brazilian athletes needed to go through classification. Uh, and it was still the old model where you have these different uh, 
panels of CPE, Israel, ISM, WSS, um, ISOS, IPSA, IPSA was not on, in, in that, there were no blind or VI assets in that championship at the time. And I don't think there was a, a minus, uh, no, there was a minus panel as well. Or, 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 there were assets with intellectual disability and we were coming, so the, we were coming on, this was before Sydney. Uh, and all that process, so, and I said, oh, so it, that was my first meeting or the first time I had bumped into classification. And I, to be honest, I was an intern in comms. I didn't understand what was that. So, what is this classification thing? Ah, mm. So at that point, they could see them being classified, understand the logic behind seeing the classifiers, understand that these guys are volunteers. How do they do things? And wow, this is. So I started to, you know, think about all the, these processes, and 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 so I, I was privileged to be in all these moments. So when I became president of the NPC Brazil, even, even though I was young, I was uh, 2009, I was uh, 39 years old. It's young, you know, to be a president of an NPC. I think I was well prepared, and I had a very clear vision of where I wanted to take the Brazilian uh, Paralympic movement at that time. As I had a very clear visual of what I needed to do as president of the Americas Paralympic Committee with the games to consolidate. Remember the youth for Para in 2005 and in 2009, and they are still on now since then. Uh, and I had I had many mentors, uh, you know. I had many mentors, as I was Alice Campo was one of them. Uh, I think we were not close, but uh, as as sec gen of the Brazilian Paralympic Committee, and seeing what what you know Dr. Sped was was doing with the relationship with the IOC, and it's it's something I learned there then, and I still do today. Recognizing the importance of having the IOC as an ally, the importance of the of the 152 games concept and how fundamental that, that this is for the development, not only of, uh, of the big nations, you know, Canada, US, Brazil, Australia, uh, Great Britain, but how fundamental it is for a very small nation to have one athlete participating at the Paralympics. And when he or she comes back to the, or, she, or, her, or her country, the impact that it could have. I remember seeing that in, for example, in Angola, when they won their first gold medal in 2004, and how that revamped the whole uh, uh, um, Paralympic environment in that country. And now Angola is probably one of the, the top five countries in Africa. And, 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 and they even have a, a governing board member on, on the, uh, the IPC board. Andrew, I Andrew, think, can I, sorry, I just want to interrupt really quick because I want to, I want to build on what you were just talking about with that relationship with the IOC. Um, and I, I want you to speak a little bit about to, so Dr. Sedward mentioned it in his opening remarks insofar as, you know, he had met, I, Dr. Sedward, if I recall, you met with Sam Ranch in 88 in Calgary when the Winter Olympics were here. So that was a 12-year a process in between when you met with Sam Ranch in 88 to signing the first agreement with the IOC in 2000 and, and Sydney. And then close to 20 years later, I, uh, the, the agreement has now been extended to 2032. And so we talk about inclusion. Um, between the Paralympic movement and the Olympic movement as an example. Andrew, I'm wanting to, to hear from you, your thoughts on that relationship. And you're now an IOC member. Um, and whether or not even that has changed the relationship between the IPC and the IOC. And I know, for instance, there's a, a significant change as it relates to the marketing of the games. And I'm wanting you to comment on the relationship between the two organizations, how that relates to inclusion. And I'm, I'm also, I, I see the question from Carolina, um, online in the Q&A, and I would encourage others to submit questions there as well. You know, how, how perhaps that's going to look in the future as well as it relates to inclusion. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just really wanted to take advantage of you kind of raising that point and that, that relationship. Uh, I think that's far more interesting than, than, than my, my, my professional <laughs> development. Uh, well, I, first of all, I think it has been a long, a long road, uh, a long trajectory since you know, uh, you know, twelve years just to sign the first agreement with the with the ISC, and it's and and it's, I think it's a, today we have a very good relationship with the ISC. Uh, I, I don't think it will ever be a relationship between equals in terms of size. You know, the ISC is a multi-million dollar organization. We are not. 
maybe we will be one day closer to that, but we are not. So, uh, and they are the ones signing the whole CT agreement. And I think you know, we need to, to be realistic where we are. Uh, but in terms of inclusion, I think they understand, and, and it's funny because uh, Sarah was dealing with Juan Antonio Samarant, and I remember in 2000, uh, two years ago at our membership gathering in Madrid, his son, Juan Antonio Samarant Jr., IOC Vice President, came to represent the organization and speak to our members. And he said one thing that I think should be in the mind of everyone involved in this movement. He said, look, it's so obvious what we bring to the table in this relationship. You know, we bring uh, the platform of, of the Olympics, host the agreement, we bring the money, we bring some of the sponsors and the brokers. But you bring something absolutely fundamental. You know, you bring a very clear message of inclusion, of diversity, that, you know, that sport is not only for people who were born to be, you know, uh, 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 demigods, you know, people who they were born or, 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 or with a, the physique uh, that will make them uh, an athlete, you know. Uh, I have heard many times from, from different people around the world, especially media people who say, I can relate more to a Paralympic athlete than to an Olympic athlete, and I don't have a disability. Because to me, it's like someone with a disability that acquired, a, a, or someone who acquired a disability or was born with a disability and decided, I am going to be an athlete. And sometimes against his or her own body type, not impairment, but the body type, you know, is not someone who is tall, is not someone who was born with a, with a, let's say, the, the, the physical characteristics that will, you would normally see in an athlete. So, and he said, so this is our message in sports for all, uh, and inclusion. Uh, and this is a fundamental thing nowadays. And, and you have this crystal clear. We don't. We don't. You know, sometimes people see Olympic sports still as something, uh, you know, it's, it's elite. Not only elite sport in the field of play, but this is for elite. This is not, you know, very difficult to understand, to be part of the movement, to be an athlete. And you bring this fresh, uh, let's say, uh, flavor to what we do. Uh, and, and, and which corporate partners want, broadcasters want, and, and people want that, you know. Uh, so I think they know really well what they want from our partnership. We know really well what what we want from the past. Sometimes we see things different. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that in, in, in the lead up to 2016, our decision on Russia was different from the decision of the IOC at, at that time. Uh, and, and they have respected that decision. Some, of, you know, some members maybe they, they, they didn't like the decision, but they respect it. They never tried to interfere. So I think they respect us a lot as an organization. They know uh, that we will like, like, we like to be autonomous, we like to make the, our own decisions, but we are working really closely now, we're working really well together. So I think it's, it's an evolution, and we signed the agreement in, in 2018 until 2032, and there are multiple things in that agreement. One of them is, of course, marketing and, and, and sponsorship, so, and we are already benefiting from them. So some new sponsors embarking in the in the IOC, in the top bottom, they automatically become, well, but this is from this year on, huh? 21. Huh? But yeah. even before that, some of them were already saying, look, I want the Olympic and the Paralympic. So like, you know, uh, uh, Visa, when they renewed Coca-Cola, finally, and probably Dr. Serra has invested many hours in, in offices in Atlanta or, 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 or with Coca-Cola officials and so, but only now, they became, you know, uh, uh, um, sponsors of the Paralympics, not of an edition of the Paralympics, that has happened in the past, but of the IPC and the Paralympics. Uh, and this, of course, has to do with our partnership with the AOC. So I see it's a very, a, a partnership that is good for both movements. What I don't see happening, and I know maybe some, this is the question of some people, if, if, if we see the games merging at some point in the future, uh, I don't see that, and I don't think this is the, the best decision, and I, I can explain why. I know that some people might say, but the ultimate goal in terms of inclusion should be to have one, one game, games for all. I understand that, but uh, there is a very wise man called Juan Pablo Salazar. He's a Colombian guy, a guy who I love. He's in our governing board wheelchair now. Rugby. He's a wheelchair rugby player. Exactly. 
uh, uh, but you know, and he's uh, he's a, a, a disability activist, if I may say, a human rights activist. And he said something to me that, and I think he's right. If you look to the LGBT uh, plus movement, yeah, you know, and all the pride movement and the parades around the world, you could say, look, the right thing should be to have a parade for all, but any movement needs its moment to be celebrated, to bring its agenda, and to in, you know, and to make its voice be heard. And I think that for persons with disability around the world, and we're talking about one billion people, 15% of the world's population, the Paralympic Games is our parade. You know, it's the moment where disability is not only tolerated, respected, it's celebrated. And I think that is more important, you know, that moment that, look, we are the protagonists here, not we, Andrew Paulson, no, the athletes, they are the ones, you have 4,350 individuals with disabilities showing their skills, you know, inspiring the world. And I think that's the moment, the exclusive moment of persons with disability. So I don't see games merging, not, not to talk about the logistical uh, uh, um, challenges and so on, so, but I think as a movement, we need to have our own games. Uh, and some people say, ah, I should come, the game Paralympics should come first because after the Olympics, there is a little bit of an Olympic hangover. People are, okay, now we don't want to see that again. So uh, I don't see that. I don't see that. I, I think that we have the best model. I wonder what would have happened with the Paralympics, for example, in Rio, if the Paralympics was before. Uh, uh, the Olympics and maybe the same in, why not, uh, in Athens. And Robert, you remember really well the challenges with the Athens 2004 organizing committee. And because the, the Olympics will not change the date, we will come from here to here. So, so I, I, and I don't see also the will or the appetite from the IOC to that. I think they are happy with the model that we have and we are as well. So I think it's, it's a very good relationship. We learn from them every day. They learn from us every day. Where we want to go, where they want to go, understand and respect uh, each other's, um, let's say, autonomy and, and how we want to run our own organization. But there are, there are some times we need to face issues together, like Tokyo. And, and then the integration is fundamental on a day-to-day basis. So it's been a pleasure working alongside them. Uh, I have a very good relationship with with President Barr as, as you know Dr. Stero had with uh, with Samaran uh, at the time. And that's fundamental. What we're trying to do now is, is is to have more integration at an operational level and I think we are progressing well in that area. And maybe board to board, you know, the IOC E B and the governing board so they know each other better. We, we have members of their commission. Maybe it's time to invite some of them members to be in our group, working group committees and so on. Um, and how we can cascade it down to the national level. In some nations, you, you have, you know, like in Canada, you have a good relationship between both organizations. In some other nations, that is no relationship. So I think that's yeah. next. And I, so yeah, so I wanted to build on a number of the things that you talked about and I'm, I'm following the questions on the side here. So you talked about, you know, separate, um, but moving in, in, in parallel that, you know, that there are some examples like the United States, for instance, recently changing to the US OPC in Canada, uh, where I presently reside, it's still a Canadian Paralympic Committee, a Canadian Olympic Committee. So I think with the US example now, I think that brings it to five, if I'm, if I'm correct, total national Olympic and Paralympic committees globally. So you're seeing, you're seeing that evolve slowly. Some of the questions that I'm getting are, you know, with the, the, the I don't say the, not the, not the merger, but the, the, the joining relationship between the IOC and the IPC, is it having an impact, for instance, on the financial uh, realities of the Paralympic movement? And if yes, how does then that translate to uh, programming perhaps for uh, less, less developed countries? Secondly, you know, the relationship between the IOC and the IPC, does this have an impact on uh, the respective athletes back and forth? Uh, you know, our, our Olympic athletes, because the games are happening not together, 
Um, but you know, the, the, does the relationship allow for interrelationships between the Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes to perhaps change attitudes or to reinforce positive attitudes and positive relationships? And then the last part of it, and I know I'm kind of throwing a lot at you here, is the profile of the Paralympic Games. So does, does this relationship between the IOC and the IPC allow the Paralympic movement? I mean, it's now the, the, the second largest, well, it has been for, I think, a while, the second largest multi-sport games globally. But perhaps from a profile perspective, I, you know, in the United States, as an example, I think it was only in Sochi when they started televising the games using live broadcast. But that sense of awareness and that sense of profile, has that relationship from an inclusive perspective between the IOC and the IPC changed the profile of the games? Well, let's, let's try to, to answer all, all of your uh, all of your questions. Maybe, maybe not in, in the exact order, but uh yeah the us us opt they were they were already the the organization also dealing with the paralympic athletes but it was not in their name it was not let's say it was USOC, and they were already running the paralympic programs in the country acting like npt but it was not something that it was in their name or it was, and to be honest and they know that it was a very small part of what they were doing and now it has changed and it's changing due to the new leadership. So we are seeing a very positive move here. Uh, but of course, you know, U.S. is a very influential country and what happened in the U.S. influenced others. But I don't see it as a trend, David. I, I, so far we have four uh, NPCs who are also, NOCs who are also NPCs all year round. So it's U.S., Norway, South Africa, and the Netherlands. Um, and in some nations, uh, this may make sense. For example, small islands in the Caribbean. Uh, why have an NPC and an NOC duplicating uh, 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 let's say, uh, expenses in, in, in administration, why we can have one single organization. But I think it needs to fit the needs of the athletes and of the Paralympic movement in that nation. Uh, maybe in Canada, it doesn't make sense to think about a merger or thinking about a single organization, because it works well as it is. Uh, and, and we are not pushing for that. You know, I remember at the time when, yeah, when USOPC announced that, uh, a lot of media uh, questions was about, oh, this is a trend. Is this is something you're uh, uh, pushing the, the countries to do? So they you know, to merge, you know, CNNPC. And but, no, in my case in Brazil, we will never, you know, thinking with my head of four years ago, we will never like to merge with the NOC. Business. Cooperation is one thing. Cooperation, integration, meaning working together uh, in common for common goals at a national, international level, and so, but not. Not a takeover or a merge. That's that's not what we want. Uh, for the same reason why we don't believe uh, the game should merge. Some of the same reasons. And in some in some in some nations will be a disaster. Uh, at the same time, if you think that there is a trend of the international federation uh, to run both the Olympic and the Paralympic version of their sport, but then uh, we believe it's a bit different. You know, it's uh, they. Uh, they are not responsible for the Paralympic movement in any territory. What they have to do is to offer services and programs uh, to, to the different groups of athletes, including the Paralympic athletes or the para athletes. So we see that as a positive trend, but it, it's not something we are pushing because uh, even in some sports where there is an Olympic and a Paralympic person, uh, some of the Paralympic AFs, they are doing a very good job. Uh, so why would, I think it, 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 it's something that needs to fit the needs of the athletes. Like in the governance review now, we are proposing to change the fact that the IPC is an international federation for transport. Uh, and we want, if the, if the membership approves that in December, and we're still in the process of, of bringing uh, uh, the, the, the final version of, of that proposal to, to the membership, uh, of course, it's not something that is, you know, in one year, you know, so you have parathletics at the IPC. So we work both as the umbrella organization and as the IF for, for parathletics and for nine other sports. It's, it's not just not to kick the sport out. It's giving the conditions to the, so the sport can transition. And we keep saying it's not only to survive, we want them to thrive. Uh, but we do see, for example, that is a conflict of interest in our side, you know. Uh, being the umbrella organization, the NNIF, uh, and at the same time focusing on development of the membership so they can support the athletes 
uh, there is no other organization in the world that tries to do all of that. You know, uh, deal with the games, um, deal with the development of the, of the members and supporting them, and at the same time being the IF for sense for That's not that's not the best model. We change in that. Uh, the financial implications uh, you, you mentioned. Yeah, we receive a, 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 an amount of money uh, from the IOC uh, because of that agreement. Um, but also the relationship with with some of the IOC uh, top partners helps us a lot. Our biggest sponsor by far is Toyota. By far, and in Toyota's contract with us, there are some provisions that specifically say that. A good amount, or the biggest amount, of the money coming to the NPC uh, has to go towards development programs with the NPC. It's the NPC development program. There's a program specifically uh, created to use uh, Toyota's uh, funding, and it's bigger, much bigger, if you compare to the money that remains at the NPC. Uh, uh, so, I think this, that's why maybe the money that comes directly from the IOC. Is not something that will hugely benefit the, the let's say, NPCs or, or the or the partnering companies around the world. But it's what we generate from that partnership, and also the fact that we have the games back to back. Probably, when he was president of the IPC, Dr. Sero has faced many uh, the same situation I face. People saying we should organize our own games without the IOC uh, and. We don't see that this is the best option for the Paralympic Board for multiple reasons. Uh, it's not that we could not organize it. We could find nations, we could find cities, we, you know, but is it the best for the movement? We don't think so. And, and this is not the president, it's president and board. We don't think so. So uh, that's, that's what uh, I think is beneficial in having this uh, partnership with the IOC. It's not only the IOC itself, but all the Olympic. Uh, how I think environment that we can benefit. And oh, as you mentioned, the US, you're right. Uh, NBC broadcast zero hours of the London game, the most, probably the most fantastic games in, in, in Paralympic history. Uh, and now this is changing. Now this is changing. The IOC is helping, LA28 is helping, and we are slowly our own team, and this has been an effort of years, right, developing this strategy with them. You talked about the challenges of the IPC trying to do so many things um, compared to other perhaps international organizations. And I want to finish, we, we have about five, seven minutes left before I want to turn it back to Dr. Sedra for some summative comments. And I'm trying to you know, pay attention to the, to the questions on the side, which we won't get to all of them. I apologize to those who have submitted questions, but I want you to look a little ahead to the future for us um, with the Paralympic movement. I know, you know recent agreements with the UN looking at the sustainable development goals, uh, partnerships with the Valuable 500. I know the Davos uh, Economic Forum is going to be taking place, I think, in the next week or so. And so conversations about where the Paralympic movement can fit in as it relates to inclusion, perhaps at more of a business economic lens. Um, the role of athletes. Um, I, you know, I, I, I often think of this as an able-bodied individual. I'm the president of IFAPA, the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. By the way, I would be remiss if I didn't point out to people listening in that we're hosting our international conference at the University of Ascala online this coming summer. So I encourage all of you to uh, look into that with at ifapa.net. Um, but for instance, the role of athletes, the role of persons with disabilities taking on leadership roles within the Paralympic movement, the role of connections with the UN and looking at relationships with the SDGs, the role of connecting to, again, the, the valuable 500 and trying to get businesses like Toyota uh, to promote and value inclusion. What's What's the future of the Paralympic movement hold as it relates to the concept of inclusion? And then I'll, I'll finish up by passing it off to Dr. Sedwick. Yeah, we, we have introduced, so we are introducing what we are calling the third pillar to what we do. So what, so what is the purpose of the IPC? So we have a very clear uh, uh, role when it comes to support our members or then to support their athletes. So it's about membership and athletes. The second one about the game. So this is clear. What we are anyone here is this third pillar, which is our role in the human rights arena. And, and, and why are we doing this? Uh, I think, first of all, it's the right thing to do. And that's, uh, that is a famous saying by L Sir Ludwig Gutmann that uh, he, he, he said something like, uh, I hope that one day every disabled person around the world will become a taxpayer. And this means, you know, 
citizenship, being productive for society, being given the opportunity. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to do here, is to play a major role when it comes to human rights. We have the best platform in the world to do so. As I mentioned before, the games are the, let's say, the, the most iconic moment for persons with disabilities in humanity. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. So we thought we need to make better use of that, uh, 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 that platform. So that's why we, we, we brought all these available 500 UN human rights uh, ADA, because we thought the International Disability Alliance, because we thought it was important to have, there was always this, um, let's say, Paralympic movement in one side, let's say the non-Paralympic movement, the, like the human rights disability movement in, 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 in a little bit apart. So we, we're trying to converge now and, and find common goals. That's why we signed an MOU with them, and they are with us in these efforts. Um, so I think in the future, we, we are going to be seen as a sport organization, but has one that has a profound impact, not only for one billion of individuals around the world, but for, let's say, human race or human species or, 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 or humanity. Because of what we, we, the way we're using our platform, the way we are connecting persons with disability, putting light on the questions around persons with disability, and trying to connect with, for example, the you know public, the, the sorry, the private sector, because again, it's not only it's not only about jobs, you know, jobs are fundamental. We have you know the numbers from London, they are amazing. One million more persons with disability are in employment now after the game. But for example, when we have you know uh, uh, when you're watching commercials on TV, how many persons with disability do you see on the TV in the same broadcasters that they need them to be at the Paralympic Games. You know, you know what I mean? I think it's a little bit of what, how we can influence, how we can do. And then you said, and what is the role of the athletes? They are the stars. They are the stars. They are the ones. Uh, we had this um, saying, and we shared this vision with the, with the athletes at the last athletes forum in Colorado Springs. Um, unfortunately, it looks like a long time ago because of the pandemic. Uh, we want athletes to become activists at the same time. We know in some nations, activists is a very strong world, so we change to advocates. Uh, but that they have, they are conscious of what, of their impact in the world when they are running 100 meters race, when they are playing boccia, you know, when they are, you know, playing wheelchair rugby. They have a profound impact in people with and without disability, and they must, in order to, I'd say, enhance that effect, they need to be aware of that because then the microphones come. What am I going to say? When I go back to my nation, what am I doing? So I think, that, I think this is important. So I think the future for us is still world changing. Um, and I do believe that the pandemic is more than, than it should. But I think that after the crisis, uh, I think we, it's because it will be mandatory that we build a new relationship with this planet and with the people who live in this planet. And I, and, and I think diversity, inclusion, they will be absolutely fundamental things to, to, to really tackle, to really work on. And sport could be a very important uh, um, element of that for different governments around the world. And then I think the public community will play a major role. So I think I see the private sector also looking towards uh, diversity. Uh, and, and, you know, the sustainable development goals, many of them, they, they connect with the Paralympic values and things we do. So I think the future looks bright, uh, but again, we need to focus on what we should be doing. As, as I have said, we have now three pillars. So some of the other pillars, like being in International Federation for Transport, should the IPC be doing that? Is that the model of that? No, it's not. So we are going to propose membership to change that through a process. Uh, as you know, the American Paralympic Committee is still a committee of the IPC. It's not an entity in itself. Should we be running the Parapan American Games? No, I don't think so. Uh, so let's, let's uh, strengthen the American Paralympic Committee, you know, let them go independent, support them, and then they will run uh, their own games. And we will focus on what we need to do, which is membership and athletes, uh, games, and human rights, and and also the human rights arena will bring more, with that, we will accept 
funding and support that are not sports, let's say sport specific uh, related, you know, different organizations. Like we have a process, uh, a program in the Americas with the Inter-American Development Bank benefiting some countries in Latin America. And we'll start with the Caribbean. They are not interested in elite sports, these agencies and the development agencies or banks. They are interested in what sports can do for society. So we, but then we need to speak their own language, understand their goals, uh, combine that with ours, and then work with the NPCs in the specific region. And so uh, that's the future. We will be dealing, as we're dealing now with the sport movement, really well, I see international federations, WADA, all of this, with this other environment here, which is the UN Human Rights Valuable 500, development banks and agencies, all the multilateral organizations. This, this is how I see the APT moving forward and, and always serving. I think one of the things that I have learned with my two predecessors is that these organizations exist to serve the membership and not the other way around. Right. So, so we exist to serve NPCs, IFs, regions, IRSCs, and through them, we serve the athletes. Andrew, I thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I, and thank you for responding to our queries and our questions. There were so many other questions that we just didn't get a chance to get to. And I'm, it's unfortunate we weren't able to do that. Dr. Sedward, I want to pass it back to you for a few closing remarks, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, David. Um, wow. Uh, Andrew, uh, words can't, uh, just don't come to me right now to express my sincerest uh, appreciation for the time you have taken to meet with us today. Uh, I mean, we had a lot of people on air today that were listening to you and I'm sure learned a lot. Uh, I, I learned a lot today. And, you know, and it's interesting, Andrew, as you were talking about uh, growing up in the Paralympic program back in, in your home country and, and the road to becoming president was certainly not unlike the same road that I had when, when I was, uh, you know, much younger as well. In fact, starting off as a 23, 24 year old getting involved in, in Canada. And, you know, when I listen to you, uh, Andrew, as, uh, you know, as a person uh, and as a leader of, of, of our movement, I can honestly, honestly say that, that we're, we're in, we're in good hands, we're in great hands. And, uh, and I'm so proud to call you uh, our president of the International Paralympic Committee. You've already served well over the past number of years as a board member, as a vice president, and now as president. And I certainly look forward to many, many great years of uh, leadership from you and many great years ahead of us as, uh, with good friendship as well. So Andrew, on behalf of, of myself uh, uh, and Eli and David and all of our listeners, uh, good luck with the future. I, I still look forward to coming to the General Assemblies to, to reacquaint our, myself with our, our good friendship uh, and, the, and, and our many other friends. And I just can't say enough about uh, how pleased I am with, uh, with your openness, uh, uh, your honesty, your integrity, your respect. Uh, it's, it's just overwhelming, uh, Andrew. And, and uh, thank you so ever so much for taking time uh, away from your family, away from your busy schedule to spend a bit of time with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Steddard, for your closing remarks. Andrew, on behalf of Eli and myself, uh, again, we really appreciate you spending time with us. I was going to ask you to play your bass guitar to kind of send us out um, <laughs> and to finish us off. I, I look very forward to perhaps seeing you in Tokyo, uh, knock on wood, soon. Um, let's hope that those games continue to go forward. That was certainly one of the questions that got posed that we didn't get even the chance to talk to you about. They today. will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Glad to hear. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our Steadward talk for today. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for participating and joining us. I'm sorry we did not get to all of your questions. Have a great Thursday. Take care.